On the second anniversary of the disaster, about 1,600 people affected by the nuclear accident have filed lawsuits against the government and Tokyo Electric Power Company. They're demanding compensation for the suffering and losses incurred after the meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi. Most of the plaintiffs are from Fukushima, but they also include residents from neighboring prefectures. Many had to evacuate their homes because of radioactive contamination. Several lawsuits were filed on the same day at the district courts in Fukushima, Chiba, and Tokyo. Plaintiffs in Fukushima are demanding that their region be restored to its condition before the accident. Financial compensation is at a standstill because we've all suffered from the disaster in different ways. But it's also because the liability of TEPCO and the Japanese government hasn't been established. Total compensation claims filed through the courts amount to about $55 million. Bereaved residents of a disaster-hit Japanese town have marked the second anniversary of the March 11th disasters with a riverside ceremony. They sent lanterns downstream for their absent loved ones. Volunteers from Yamada in Iwate Prefecture organized the event on Monday evening. Two years before, 800 of the town's people were lost in the earthquake and tsunami. The residents wrote messages on the paper lanterns. Japanese people believe these words will reach the souls of the dead. They lit about 100 lanterns and floated them down the river. The residents watch the lanterns light up the water with their memories of the past and their messages of hope for the future. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has pledged to draw up a reconstruction roadmap that will enable many of those who suffered to restart their lives. Abe said he wished to express deep felt condolences to the people who lost loved ones in the disasters and those with relatives still missing. He added that his heart goes out to all those affected by the catastrophe. The disasters shouldn't be discussed in the past tense since they're still going on. But we can see some rays of hope in the affected areas thanks to the efforts of local people. I want to make these individual rays brighter and stronger. Are they pledged to promote special housing projects for those who lost their homes? He also called for a stepped-up effort to relocate disaster-hit communities on a large scale. The Prime Minister said a roadmap will be drawn up this summer. He said it will outline when infrastructure, including roads and waterworks, will be rebuilt in areas near the nuclear accident site to allow evacuees to return home. As we saw from the Tokyo studio, Monday marks the second anniversary of the giant earthquake and tsunami. Officials from a country hit by a similar disaster are trying to learn from Japan's experience. NHK World's Takatoshi Shiozaki reports. The Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004 left over 220,000 people dead or missing. The tsunami was caused by an earthquake that struck near the Indonesian city of Banda Aceh. About 80,000 people there were killed. Hafriza is a city employee in Banda Aceh. He's visiting the city of Higashima Tsushima in northeastern Japan to learn about disaster recovery. Hafriza was a college student nine years ago when the tsunami struck. He was back home visiting Bandache. I felt a violent jolt when I was resting after morning prayers. I thought at first that my friends were shaking me as a practical joke. But I woke up and realized it was a big earthquake. He was worried about the tsunami. He knew how powerful tsunami can be from reading Japanese comics. His family fled to the second floor of their home. They survived, but he lost many other relatives and friends in the disaster.
More than 1,000 people died in Higashimatsushima in the March 2011 tsunami. Officials from the two cities have been visiting each other during the past year. Hafiza left for Japan with another city officials on Saturday. Pertama saling menyemangati. We can encourage each other. Our communities were ruined, but as long as we're alive, we have a future. He will run about disaster preparedness and recovery work, including spreading information overseas. He will also share the experience of Bandache after the tsunami. He hopes this exchange of information can help the recovery of the two cities. Takato Shiozaki, NHK World, Bandache. When the disaster hit, people grabbed their gadgets to capture what they saw. Those images, along with broadcasting footage, provide a record of the events as they unfolded. The problem, up to now, was that no one had gathered all the information in a single place. The creators of a new website have a solution and a way to preserve the data for future generations. NHK World's Tomoko Kamata has the story. A tsunami floods a community. People pick up their lives. This digital archive houses more than 20,000 photos, video clips, and other documents related to the disaster. The website is a joint project between Japan's Internal Affairs and Communications Ministry and the National Diet Library. Officials launched it on Thursday. They say anyone, anywhere can use it. The website provides an online clearinghouse for mountains of data about the earthquake and tsunami. Until now, the records were scattered. Academics, government officials, as well as members of the media and nonprofits, each looked after a portion. But that created challenges. People had a hard time tracking down information, and there was a risk that materials would be lost. The website makes it much easier to search for images. Just punching keywords like tsunami and the name of a town, and click on a thumbnail you're interested in. A map pops up with links to photos and video, along with details about exactly when and where they were filmed. People can also access recordings of witnesses' accounts and learn how the region is recovering. The website managers say they'll keep adding data as it becomes available. We want people around the world to really understand just how extensive the damage was. We think the database will help people in other countries make their own disaster preparations. The website's creators say they want it to be more than just a record. They hope the archive will help turn Japan's disaster into something meaningful for people the world over. Tomoko Kamata, NHK World. If you want to find out more about this, visit the website at http://kn.ndl.go. JP. Not all areas in Fukushima require decontamination. In many districts where people live, the radiation level is roughly the same as in other parts of Japan. Still, local officials have started a long-term monitoring program for the two million residents of Fukushima. They're working to assess the health risks from the radiation emitted at the time of the Fukushima Daiichi accident. They say they have not found cases of exposure that could cause health problems so far, but many feel they have to remain. On guard, NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa has more. Ruriko Mashiko and her 18-year-old daughter Runa had lived in Koriyama, Fukushima, all their lives. They're constantly worried about the radiation released from Fukushima Daiichi. I'm concerned about our internal exposure. They're concerned because radioactive cesium has a half-life of 30 years. Mashiko took her daughter to the hospital to find out if she'd been exposed. We did not detect cesium in your body. We don't think there's any accumulation in your system. Many people in Fukushima have been getting checked. Once humans ingest cesium, 
either by breathing, drinking, or eating, it can emit radiation inside them and could cause cancer. More than 40,000 people had the examination at this hospital alone. Most were cleared, but five people tested positive. Their cesium levels were at or below the safety standard set by the Japanese government. The staff questioned the patients and found they had eaten wild plants, such as mushrooms and berries, which aren't screened. The research team concluded that's where the cesium came from. One expert says, according to their research, the only risk of internal radiation exposure is from eating unscreened food. Is that as long as people here in Fukushima are buying、uh, food from market or supermarket, for instance,、uh, they do not need to worry so much about internal contamination. Professor Hayano says screening for radiation in food. And internal radiation checks should continue for years. After the Chernobyl accident, also the percentage of internal contamination decreased,、uh, but then it went up again after five, ten years. And we have to make sure that it doesn't happen here in Fukushima. Mashiko now says she believes the risk of exposure is low. Still, she's taking precautions. She reads about what she buys, where it's from, and how it's tested. It's a heavy psychological burden because we always have to be conscious when buying and eating food, and this may last for decades. I feel insecure. Mashiko wonders how long she and her daughter will have to stay on guard. Many people in Fukushima are wrestling with the same dilemma, and likely will for years to come. Mitsuko Nishikawa, NHK World, Kodiyama.